It is great to be here on the campus of Franciscan University with all of you. Uh, and, and I've been, it's been a great spring. Um, when they asked me to be a part of the team again, I always say yes, but then I looked at the roster and we have Deacon Bob Rice and we have Deacon Harold and we, you know, we have Deacon uh, Ralph and, and I'm like, what am I gonna do? So I prayed and uh, in December, I asked the director of our diaconate formation program here in the Diocese of Steubenville if uh, they were gonna be starting a new class. And he, he said, yes, uh, next month in January, we're starting. And I was like, so it's probably too late to apply? He goes, yeah, yeah, we, we've already gone and accepted all the guys into the program that we're going to them. And I'm like, okay, um, when are you gonna start the next class? And they said, oh, in, in two years, you can, you can uh, again, uh, apply to be a deacon. I'm like, great, I love it. I'll be, I guess I'll talk to you in two years. And then as I was walking away, uh, Deacon Mark said to me, he's like, well, how old will you be in two years? I'm like, what kind of question is that? None of your business. But I mean, I'm like, I'll, I'll, I'll be turning 60. And he said, oh, well, we have, you have to be under the age of 60 to, to be able to apply to be a deacon. And I was like, well, God, I was open. I don't know, your timing, your will, whatever, God. Um, two days later, he called me back. He said, John, I went and talked with the bishop, pleaded your case. We're going to allow you to apply. And in January, my wife and I started our formation together for the permanent diaconate. So I'm going to join the Deacons Club, God willing. And I'll tell you something, even if I don't get ordained, just to be able to go through this formation with my wife has already started to just bless us, and I'm excited to see what the Lord will do there. He has a lot to do. We, we, want, we want him to do more in our lives. Um, and so, you know, just, just pray for me. Pray for me that the Lord's will is done. That's all I want, and that, uh, the, that his grace continues to lead me down wherever, whatever that path might be. I've learned uh, in a lot of ways just to, to surrender and let God have his way. And I'm, as I was preparing for this talk, I, I started thinking about spring of 1999. In spring of 1999, I was sitting in a park bench outside of a hotel in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I had spent the previous weeks leading up to that traveling all over the state of, of Colorado, where I was living at the time, took, took a few road trips, uh, interviewing for a youth ministry position. I'd gotten out of youth ministry, but really had felt the strong call to get back into ministry after the church that I was working at, uh, Saint, uh, or not working at, but volunteering at, um, some of the kids there were killed in the Columbine tragedy. And I really felt like I got, I've got to be doing this. And, uh, and so my wife and I, we visited this parish in Ohio, up in Lima, and we thought, oh, this is they had everything we want because I'd done youth ministry for seven years. I knew exactly what I was looking for. I had my list. The church had to have a youth room. It had to have two priests and including a younger priest who was really interested in helping with youth ministry. It had to have a very vibrant young adult community. They had to be open to being a life teen parish. I mean, I had the list and it went down because I was, it was more about me interviewing the parish to make sure they were worthy of me. And so we were uh, traveling. We'd been up in Michigan. We stopped by this parish. We were getting ready to go home, and I got a phone call. Because my wife, she was so wonderful. She sent up my resume through job boards and all that. And this parish in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, found my resume, called me up, and they're like, well, you would be great. We want you to come here. And, and Would you please come here and interview? And at that point, I think we were like almost 85 to 90% sure that, that Ohio was going to be our choice. And everything in my flesh didn't really want to do this. But I felt like God was, you know, either God was doing it or I think maybe more at that point, I just didn't know how to say no. So I said, okay, I'll come in, I'll, I'll come and interview. So I went there. I went through two full days of interview. I, I, I interviewed with a pastor, the associate pastor, the parish council, this group of parents, the church's staff, a group of teenagers. I had like eight different interviews. They took me on a tour of the city and it was this whirlwind. So I was sitting on this bench because I was tired. It had been really two full days. And it was very beautiful. They were very wonderful, and they had this great vision for youth ministry. However, the pastor was going to retire in four months. He wasn't interested in starting anything new, including Life Team. The associate pastor at the time wasn't too keen on youth ministry in general. 
they had a school. I, that was one of the things. I didn't want to go to a church with a school because schools, the problem there is it takes a lot of resources. And then the parents who send their kids to Catholic school don't feel like they have to send their kids to youth ministry and you're stuck. You know, it's like really hard to get the kids involved. And all these things that were on my list, they had none of it. In fact, they showed me what would be my office, and it was a converted storage uh, room that was uh, that opened up to the outside, and the door was under a fire escape on the back of this building, and it smelled like chemicals, <laughs> which is good, I suppose, if I wanted to just sit around getting high all day, but I wanted to do ministry. And, and this was not where I was going to go. And so as I was talking with my wife on my cell phone, I was just like, yeah, they're very wonderful, beautiful people, but this is not the place. And I said, I love you. I'm flying home tomorrow. I'll see you soon. And I hung up the phone. And, you know, God has an amazing way of working in very profound and beautiful ways in the simplest of moments. And as I sat there, I simply got the sense, like, this is a big decision, God. I don't want to mess this up. So I bowed my head and I said, Lord, not my will, but yours. Show me, Lord. Make sure that I'm making the right choice for my family. And as clear as anything I've ever heard in my life, I heard it in my ears, I heard it in my head, I heard it in my heart, I heard it in the depths of my soul. I heard God say, I'm calling you here. I mean, I, I can count the number of times this has happened in my life on three fingers. And this was like one of the big ones. I was like shocked. I was like, uh, I, 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 I didn't even know what to say. When I took a deep breath and paused, I said the only thing I could come to say to God, I'm like, well, God, if this is really you, you need to say it again. <laughs> and just as clear as the first time, I heard, John, I'm calling you here. And all of a sudden, like, the whole, not the room, because I was outside, but the whole neighborhood started to spin. And I felt like I had this wave of fear, anxiety, uh, excitement. Oh, my gosh. But after that kind of wave hit, I just felt this profound sense of God's love. Like, God just called me by name. He called me by name. But what was he calling me to do? I had to process this, so I did the only thing I could do is I called my wife back. Honey? You, you, you know when I said that this wasn't going to work out, that we're, you know, like, we, this really wasn't a good, a good place for, for us, you know? What if I told you that God just said we're supposed to be here? And, and, and really, my wife is the true hero of the story because I heard the voice of God. I, I, I know without a doubt God called me. She put her full faith in me and said, okay. Two weeks later, everything we owned in a 27-foot moving truck. Our three babies in car seats in the minivan that she was driving while I was driving everything else behind her, heading from Colorado to a place she had never even been before. It was, the, at that point, the biggest step of faith we had taken in our lives. And I tell you this because in this story... You are all involved in some way. Most of you, maybe even all of you. And here's how. When I landed in North Carolina, I was picked up by a man named Jack McAleer. Jack had three children, his two older daughters. One was going to be a freshman in high school that fall. The other was, going to, was in junior high, and I was going to be their youth minister. So he was personally invested in making sure I had what I needed. And he was personally invested in making sure that my wife and, had, and I had everything we needed to succeed in ministry. He took us under his wing and showed us a lot of extra love and, and care. And along the way, we became very good friends. He helped us come to Steubenville with the youth group. And while he was here, he had a powerful encounter with the Lord that changed the trajectory of his life. I mean, he became so invested in the youth ministry program, he and another group of uh, adult guys started doing all the games for us on our retreats. They were great. And as Jack and I grew into her friendship, you know, he, he ended up being uh, the godfather. He and his wife, Jamie, godparents to my son, John Paul, who was born while we were living in North Carolina. 
And when four years later, I got a call from Father Dave. At the time, Father Dave was directing all the youth conferences, and he was getting moved into a vice presidency position with the university and asked me if I'd be interested in applying for his job. And of course, the opportunity to come back to my alma mater and serve. I love Franciscan University. I couldn't say no, so I applied for the job. And in 2003, I began working for Franciscan University. At the very time I said yes to this job, Jack's daughter, Laura, Lauren, was trying to decide where she was going to go to college. It was down to two choices, Auburn or Franciscan. And when I chose to come here to work, she chose to come and be a freshman here that fall. And so in the fall of 2003, Jack came to campus with his daughter. I should say something about Jack just because his family owns Krispy Kreme Donuts. And he, it, it, and he came to me with this, I want to make a, a donation to the university. Who should I talk to? And I didn't know who he should talk to, so I just said, I'll, I'll introduce you to Father Dave. Now, Father Dave, in his own way, because he's so awesome, became very good friends with Jack and Jamie. And when Lauren was here, she fell in love with a great guy named Dan, who was a comm arts major. And upon graduation, he and Jack developed this media company called 4PM Media. And one of the very first projects they worked on and produced was the Wild Goose series. Which is so true of my life. Most of the, the major ways that God has intervened in my life and spoken to me and, and dealt with me personally, it's never been about me. Never. But I can look back and say, I didn't star in the, in, the, in the Wild Goose. I didn't appear in the Wild Goose. I didn't write the Wild Goose. But God used my life to bring together two awesome people who produced something that have literally changed the course of thousands and thousands of people's lives and helped them experience more of the Holy Spirit. And I can just sit back and say, God, why do you work this way? What is it that is about you that you choose to work this way? I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. In fact, I, I look at myself in the same lens that the Blessed Mother saw. This is what she said when, when looking at, you know, all the things that she was being called to do as she was giving back the praise that Elizabeth was giving her. Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She says, look, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant, Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Now look, I know that when I die, I probably won't have any statues, <laughs> any devotions. No one's going to coin a, a medal and wear, a, wear it around it with my picture on it with reverence. And that's fine with me. I'm not looking for that. But I do know that I can stand up here tonight and say to you, because of my yielding, because of God's intervention, because God has done great things for me. And he came to me on that night and spoke into my heart that great things have happened. I could speak for the next 10 hours on the great things that have happened to me personally. But that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to say any one of us can experience this. God wants to come to each one of you and do something great in your life. That's what he's dying to do. He made you for, for greatness. Why wouldn't he? You're created in his image and likeness. Your soul was purchased and set free from the gates of hell, from the power of sin and death, by the blood of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And he has poured his love, his very essence into you through the power of the Holy Spirit and ask you to join his family as an adopted son or daughter. Amen? Amen? We should all want to say, Lord, I want to magnify you. I want to glorify you. I want to give you everything for you've done great things for me. If somebody calls me blessed, it's only because God, you've done it. It's not about me. It's about me receiving you know, St. Faustina had this beautiful relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Such a beautiful, intimate relationship with her, and, and with him. And, 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 and this is what Jesus said to her. He said, the graces of my mercy are drawn by means of one vessel only, and that is trust. 
the more a soul trusts, the more it will receive. Trust is first and foremost a choice for us to receive the unconditional love of God for us, his mercy, and be willing to let that love penetrate the deepest part of us and transform us and embolden us and empower us to say yes, to incarnate that love in every part of our lives. It's a decisive choice, but it's also a response to grace. The Catechism speaks of our need for trust and surrender. Through the Holy Spirit, we are adopted as God's children, but that gift demands, demands a response. It says in Article 2784, it says the free gift of adoption requires, it's not optional, it's required on our part, continual conversion and new life. It requires two fundamental dispositions. I love this. It requires two fundamental dispositions. So this should be the posture of our soul before God. First, the desire to be like him. Jesus, you're my everything, including who I want to be. The whole purpose of us coming forward to receive the Eucharist is that in the end we would become what we consume and be consumed by the love that's there. It says, though created in his image, we are restored to his likeness by grace, and we must respond to this grace. We must respond to the grace of Christ. And it goes on to say in the next article, 2785, it says, second, a humble and trusting heart that enables us to turn and become like children. For it is to little children that the Father is revealed. So we come before the Lord not in our greatness, but in our smallness. Smallness. Not in our richness, but in our poverty. I mean, Mary said it best. He has looked upon the lowliness of his servant. That's why every generation calls her blessed. She's the handmaid of the Lord. She never wanted the glory. She wanted to be the handmaid. And she knew everything that she was was just a reflection of the great things that God had first done in her. And she is our template. She is our guide. She is the role model. St. Faustina went on to write, a humble soul does not trust itself, but places all its confidence in God. We are called to empty ourselves of all our self-love, all of our self-righteousness, all of our self-longing, all this clinging, and empty ourselves before God. Pope Benedict XVI, I love this, what he says. He says it's only in accepting God's love that we come to know who we truly are. This is what he says. He says, man comes in the most profound sense to himself, not through what he does, but through what he accepts. And one cannot become holy in any other way than by being loved, by letting oneself be loved. We will not become who God made us to be until we just surrender to the fact that we are unconditionally, unlimitedly loved by God and have the trust to sit in the Father's hands and let him hold us close to his heart. This afternoon, I had this image as we were praying in Christ the King uh, during the Life and the Spirit seminar of, of, of Jesus just coming to each person and placing his hands on his shoulder and while, they're there, while they're praying like this, just leaning forward and touching his forehead to, to their forehead and just breathing life into their heart, breathing life into them. The breath of God, the ruah of God, the spirit of God. He was breathing it into the people there. And in that, souls and hearts were coming alive. St. Catherine of Siena would say, the devil fears a heart that's on fire with the love of God. And this is why Satan will do whatever he can to keep us from just fully surrendering to this, this to every part of us. Like this thing of, of trust is so vital. You know, Father Dave talked about St. Peter stepping out on, on the boat. That was a step of faith, a step of trust. And, and what I love about the story is there was no downside. St. Peter walked on water. He was walking towards the Lord, and it wasn't until he took his eyes off Jesus and started looking at his circumstances again that he began to sink. But where did he end up? Jesus immediately pulls him up, looks him in the eye, and says, why did you doubt? Come on, let's get back in the boat. So now they're walking together. I mean, he walked on water, and the other 11 just, I'm sure they were just picking their jaws up off the deck of the boat going, why didn't we get out there? 
That could have been me. Why didn't I take a step of faith? They weren't thinking, oh, what? look at Peter. He tried and he failed. He's like, he walked on the water with Jesus. Because what Jesus is teaching us is a, as long as we're in his arms, as long as he's by our side, we can do it. Anything, including walking on water. Because God doesn't want us to walk alone. You've never walked alone. You never will walk alone. And if you let Jesus love you with his unconditional love, you will walk on water with him. He will do amazing things in you and through you. But we have to ask God, I think, to take us to a place, even if it requires us to cry out to God tonight as we pray, heal me because my trust has been broken. We have a culture of misplaced trust, broken promises, damaged lives. We all need to return to the singular reality that the love of Jesus is the only unshakable, unchangeable, unmutable, everlasting thing in this world. And it's the only thing worthy of our trust. Amen? In fact, when you go back to the very beginning, what was the first thing that died in the Garden of Eden? The Catechism says in Article 397, it says, man tempted by, devil, by the devil let his trust in his creator die. Abusing his freedom, he disobeyed God's command. This is what man's first consisted of. First sin consisted of all subsequent sin would be disobedience towards God and a lack of trust in his goodness. Every sin that we have ever committed can be traced back towards a lack of trust in God's goodness and us thinking that we know better for ourselves what will make us happy. I think of all the years I've wasted my life pursuing happiness on my own terms, all the times I go in and out, in and out. But what has gotten me over humps and into greater freedom is the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the only one that can do it. Article 154 in the Catechism says, believing in God, having faith in God is impossible without the Holy Spirit. He's not the, uh, the, the luxury item in the luxury car. He's the engine. He's the fuel. He's the fundamental driving factor that animates us in our life in Christ that keeps us moving forward with Jesus. And we can't do it. It's a supernatural call, and we need supernatural grace. Jeremiah 17, 7, 8 says, Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when the heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green in the year of drought. It is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. I think oftentimes we are, when, we're, when, when everything's going well and our circumstances are, are, are comforting, then we thrive. But when, when we get into these seasons of life where, where, where things are dry, where the heat is on and we're under pressure, we have a tendency to wither. But to be trusting in the Lord means to be rooted like a tree that sends out its, its roots by water, by the stream, by that stream of the Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? It, can mean, it means we can live, live without fear, that we can trust in God. And even if our circumstances are saying one thing, God is dictating what's going on in our hearts. We can have faith, confidence. We can have that hope. We can have that love. We can stay connected and bear fruit. I have had many experiences, and I just want to share one real briefly. Some of you have heard this story. Five years ago, 2018, I'm in Rochester, Minnesota, running one of our youth conferences, about ready to sit down for lunch when I got a call from my son Andrew's girlfriend at the time. And she was frantic. And she said, we were in a car accident. They just took Andrew to the hospital. I'm not sure what's going on. And, and, I, and I tried to get as many details as possible. But she was just so upset. So I had to call my wife, and, we're, and she was on her way to figure out what was going on. Which ho- we didn't even know what hospital he was in. And here I was, hundreds of miles away in Minnesota, and, and trying to figure out, how am I going to get back to Ohio as quickly as possible? I got the next possible flight. 
but it didn't, it had flight delays. I mean, I didn't get home till two o'clock in the morning. I didn't know when I was in the air if my son was dead, my son was alive. I didn't know what was going on. But this I did know. While I was in the airport, I sent text messages to the hosts of all of our conferences that were happening. And there were six conferences happening that weekend across the United States and Canada. And that night, while I was in the air flying home, over 10,000 teenagers were before the Blessed Sacrament praying for my son. The next day, when my wife and I sat down with the doctor, he was not giving us any kind of hope. He said, look, 19 fractures in his skull. We had to do an emergency craniotomy. We took the upper one-third of his skull out. He's intubated. He hasn't woken up. We're not sure if he will or when that will happen. It could be weeks. When he wakes up, he may not remember how to talk. He may not remember his name. He might not remember who you are. We're really not sure what the extent of his injuries are, but we want you to be prepared for, it's going to be months, if not years, of rehabilitation and therapy. And I remember, like, listening to the doctor and not making light of a single word he said. It hit us hard. But also knowing underneath all that, God's just saying to me, I've got that. And so they had a chapel at the hospital. We spent some time there, and I just surrendered. I said, God, I didn't put my faith in a desired outcome at that point. I just said, God, we don't know, but here's what I do. I put my son in your hands, and I want you to give me the strength to do whatever I need to do. Sacrifice whatever I need to sacrifice to get him well again. Just whatever it takes, God, just give me the strength to do that. Because I felt... If, if, if it were up to me, I would fail for sure. But God, you can be my strength in this. And my wife prayed the same thing with me. We surrendered everything. And the, <laughs> and the next day, my daughter, Madeline, was wiping some blood off my son's face because, you know, it was really such a quick thing to get him into surgery. And he had the emergency operation, and then he was in intensive care. He had a tube coming out of his throat. By the end of the second day, they had taken the tube out. He was able to breathe on his own, but he still hadn't woken up. He hadn't said anything. But, and she, she's just trying to clean him up, and she's a nurse, and so she was being very kind and gentle, and she's wiping his face off and saying, Andrew, it's going to be okay. I'm just cleaning you up a little bit. And he started to twitch. Like, like he could feel it, and he didn't like it. And after a couple of minutes... He just kind of opened his eyes and looked at her and said, will you please stop that? <laughs> In God's plan, there are two powerful things, prayer and the ability of one sibling to annoy another, <laughs> even wake them out of what might have been a coma. <laughs> Long story short, in less than a month, Andrew was home with us. I don't have time to go through all the miracles and minor miracles and, and everything. But I will tell you this. Once again, it wasn't about me. I stand before you not because I've ever done anything great for the Lord. I stand before you and I am who I am because God has done great things for me. And tonight, God wants to do great things for each one of you. Perhaps the, the most beautiful thing that he can do is just reveal his heart to you. And many of you might still be holding back. You've been burned. You've been hurt. Maybe you're still angry with God because something that you wanted him to do, it didn't work out the way you hoped it would. You placed your faith in Jesus and he let you down. I think when it comes to God, we don't put our faith in a desired outcome because we don't always get what we want because God knows what's truly best for us. And what's best for us at any given moment is surrender. Trust and surrender. Believing, hoping, continuing to take these steps, even if it's a baby step tonight. You know, each one of us has a door on our heart. 
The door has a handle, but the handle's on the inside. All that God can do is come and knock. And you have to open your heart to him. Tonight, I believe the Lord wants to heal, wants to restore trust in so many of us, wants to take our belief and our confidence in his perfect love to the next level. Some of you have been through a lot of storms. Tonight, all I'm asking you is to take your eyes off the storms and let's place them on Jesus because in a few minutes, he's going to be brought into this room and then he's going to be processed through this room and when Jesus comes near, a simple gesture of trust, reaching out to him, a simple prayer of surrender, Jesus, I give my heart to you. Fill me with your light and life and love through the power of your Holy Spirit. Give me everything I need to know you. Open the eyes of my heart so I can see, experience, taste, and see your love tonight in this room, God. I give you everything. I surrender everything. You know, God is going to call a lot of you to do great things for him. Things that will seem beyond your capacity. And even tonight, he wants to prepare you for those moments by building trust and confidence in his power. We will do great to the extent that we receive greatly. To to the extent that we surrender and let God do something first. So that's my invitation to each one of us tonight. Let us ask God to do something great in our lives because you were made for that greatness. You have a capacity for that greatness. You have a hunger for that greatness, the greatness of his love to be poured out you in abundance. So let's just without hesitation tonight, without reservation, give it all to Jesus. Amen? Amen.